That was the dream of a lifetime come true. I had wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot just like my dad from the time I was 10 years old. And after not getting selected the first time I applied to test pilot school, when I got the word that yes, I'm on the list, I'll be going to test pilot school starting in June of 1976, I was just positively thrilled. So when I finished the cruise in the F-14 Tomcat, I wanted to go to test pilot school then, right then and there. And initially, I failed to screen for test pilot school. And here I am, I've got fleet experience in two different types of fighters and an aeronautical engineering degree, and I had done well in my squadrons. So we couldn't understand why I didn't screen for test pilot school. Well, meanwhile, what had happened was the Navy had decided that F-14 Tomcat training is so valuable and so expensive that once you're into the Tomcat, we're not letting you out. So they had not made me available for the screening. So my air wing commander was a big fan. He was a test pilot school graduate. And he pulled some strings to get my name to the, to the commanding officer at test pilot school. And he went up to Washington, D.C., and put my application on the desk and said, you're not letting us look at somebody like this. And so with all that help, I got selected to go to test pilot school. And what a great experience that was. And I, I feel like that took a lot of the aeronautical engineering that I had learned and put it into practice and put it into use. Uh, it was a fascinating course of instruction. Half of the day was spent in academics and the other half of the day was in flight testing. And you could, be, you could be assigned to three airplanes at one time. So initially when I got there, I was allowed to fly the T2C Buckeye. I was flying the T-38 Talon, Air Force airplane. And my third airplane was the A-7 Corsair, Corsair II. The A-7 Corsair II was a particularly intriguing development during a time when the aviation industry was embracing supersonic speeds and experimenting with unique airframe designs in the 1950s and 1960s. Although the Corsair II may not have possessed the supersonic capabilities of many other aircrafts during its time, its reliability and versatility made it a valuable asset for the U.S. Navy. Its unique design allowed it to remain in service even as other more advanced aircrafts were being proposed, making it an important asset for many years. Designed for use during the Vietnam War, the Corsair II was a reliable and powerful strike aircraft that prioritized features such as a large range, a high payload capacity, and cost effectiveness over more flashy attributes. Despite its limitations, the A-7 could still perform well in the right hands, but it was not designed to be a fighter aircraft. Its large fuel capacity also made it useful as an airborne tanker. In total, 1,500 warplanes were built, and the Corsair II became the backbone of aerial carrier-launched operations during the Vietnam War, with up to 854 models participating in over 97,000 sorties. The majority of the missions carried out by the A-7 were low-altitude dive strikes, known for their reliability and pinpoint accuracy. The Corsair II only lost 54 units throughout its combat service in the Vietnam War and was considered a highly survivable platform for the U.S. Navy, despite concerns that its lack of supersonic speed would make it vulnerable to enemy fighters after a dive attack. The A-7 continued to serve for decades after its initial debut, with several different iterations developed. It has flown over 120,000 combat sorties and performed exceptionally well in conflicts in Vietnam, Libya, Grenada, Panama, and Operation Desert Storm. In an era of ambitious and costly aircraft design, the Corsair II proved that sometimes the best aircraft is not the fastest or the most expensive, but the one that can be produced in large numbers while keeping pilots safe. And so you, you could fly all three of those airplanes and you would get assigned a particular flight test to go conduct. 
and then write a report on it. So you'd have a report due every week. And the reports were graded extremely critically. And you were also explained to you that a C plus is a perfectly acceptable grade. They didn't hand out A's and B's. Uh, so a C plus was, a, was an average grade. And that took a little getting used to because you're used to getting A pluses. And now, now, now if you got a C plus, you were supposed to feel good about it. But when you got your report back, it had bled to death. It had red lines, <laughs> marks, and scribbling, and you should have worded this this way and all that all over it. It was an incredible learning experience. I've never worked harder in my life than I did that one year in test pilot school. And for that entire year, I had one weekend that I didn't work on something either Saturday or Sunday. The rest of the year, I worked uh, the majority of the weekends. I worked both days on reports and getting prepared for the next week. But there was one weekend that I took both days off. And so that was, that was incredible. So this was, this was more challenging and more hard work than, than college was. It was more work than Navy flight training was. So as I say, it's the hardest I ever worked, but it was also probably the most satisfying thing I've done. Why? Partly, I guess, because I had wanted to be a test pilot all my life, and now here we go. I am one. I am being a test pilot. And I've always enjoyed the the aspect of, okay, how does an airplane perform and why does it perform and how do I measure it? How do I, how do I present it in a graph? How do, I, how do I talk about it? And the test pilot is the go-between to the engineers that design the vehicle. And so he has to be, he or she has to be every bit as conversant with aerodynamics and flight dynamics and structures because you're doing structural testing as well while you're doing aerodynamic testing and you have to be the one who can explain to the engineering staff what's wrong with the airplane you are trained to be very critical and of course when you don't want to hear it <laughs> when you're assigned to uh, an airplane in the fleet I was assigned to F-4 Phantoms, and I was assigned to F-14 Tomcats. That became the greatest airplane in the world because it's my airplane. And everything about it is great. It's fantastic. It's a giant performer. It's great, great, great. You're trained to be the opposite way as a test pilot. You're trained to point out every little thing that's wrong with it, every little thing you don't like about it. So all of a sudden, you've got to be very critical about it. It's not your baby anymore. And so that was a learning curve as well. But you have to have that because the designers uh, can put all these things into it, but the end user is the one that's got to be able to say what's good or what's bad about it. And that's the job of a test pilot. Generally speaking, how receptive are the designers and the engineers to your squawks when you get back? Do they, they, have, they get defensive? They, or? No, they don't get defensive. They have been very responsive to it. And of course... The manufacturer wants to produce a good product. And part of producing a good product is making something that's very usable. And that's what the test pilot does is evaluate how usable is it. For dummies like me, the airplanes that you were assigned at Pax River, what stage of development are they in? Are, are, the, are you really test flying it? Or are these airplanes that have already passed muster and they're online and they're just testing you they're they're actually just testing the pilot so these are all airplanes that have been certified that have completed all their development testing which doesn't mean that they don't have bad characteristics and so for example the a7 corsair that had some of the worst stall and departure characteristics of any airplane i've ever flown when you stalled the a7 it would depart not in pitch not up and down it would depart in yaw and as you got close to the stall, you felt it getting as if the rudder, the whole vertical tail was being blanked. And all of a sudden, it would take off in a big yaw direction, a, a side slip, a giant side slip. It could take 8,000 feet to recover from that, which says these are horrible stall characteristics. Why did we let that airplane get produced that way? Well, I think it was the rush of Vietnam and the crush that was going on then. 
And there, there were fixes that were made to it later on that, that improved a lot of that. But it was great to be able to see, here's something horrible that an airplane does. Uh, because if you're, if you're in a bomb run and you depart the airplane in the bomb run, you're going to have to eject. You're not going to have enough altitude to recover. So that's one of the lessons that you learn as a test pilot is point out all the deficiencies. And you'd have things called a Category 1 deficiency, which means this airplane cannot be used for its intended purpose until we fix this deficiency. And so the test pilot speaks the same language that the engineers and the, and the designers do. And so you're able to communicate effectively to them Here's what's wrong with this airplane, and we don't necessarily figure out how to fix it. The test pilot doesn't figure out how to fix it. Sometimes we know the answer, but you're able to tell them and convince them that here's something that we've got to fix. Here again, I imagine your uh, aeronautical engineering degree helped you. Oh, immensely. Talking yes. to those guys. Absolutely. Helped immensely. Or girls. Helped immensely with all of this. And, and of course, it, it can't help but give you some credibility as well. You know, I think uh, the average person would think, okay, Navy test pilot school, Patuxent River, Air Force guys go to Edwards. Um, but then you mentioned you were testing an Air Force airplane. It's not that cut and dried, is it? No, it isn't. And, and part of the other things that we were there to evaluate were the flying qualities. There are specifications on flying qualities, handling qualities, uh, stall golly stall uh, potential and things like that but handling qualities were important too because uh, the way the airplane responds to control stick inputs is very important to the way it flies and there are specifications for things that we call the short period oscillation the long period oscillation and however even if you failed one of those standards you could fail a standard, but the test pilot could also have an opinion that says, however, the airplane is suitable for its role, even with this. So, so there were always all these things that you were having to balance and having to weigh. And in the test pilot school, you were learning how to do that using both good examples of airplanes and bad examples of airplanes. Now, once I finished test pilot school, now I'm an active test pilot, and I was working on follow-on programs with the F-14 Tomcat. And so there are always that sort of thing, thing going on. Uh, so I flew the very first flight of the reconnaissance modification to the F-14 Tomcat, and then flew all the developmental flights of it, which involved uh, taking it out to, how fast did I take it? I took it out to 1.65 Mach number and six and a half G's. And so of course you're also doing structural verification. And so after after finishing test pilot school, now yeah, you're gonna be a tough be, way to experience a failure. <laughs> now you're gonna be working on actual flight test programs. Yeah. So I had I had a year of that uh, before it all got interrupted by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I was gonna say what what career path did you think you were on until you fell in love with the shuttle? I had achieved the career path that I had hoped for, which was, which was to be a Navy test pilot. So you were going to do that as long as you could and retire with well, ruffles the, and flourishes? Well, the way, <laughs> the way the Navy worked is you had a tour at Patuxent River, and your first year was test pilot school, and then you had a two-and-a-half-year tour, if I remember right, as a test pilot, then you were going back to the operational fleet. You were oh. going back to an operational squadron. Uh, I believe that the Air Force does it a little differently. You go to Edwards Air Force Base, go through test pilot school, and then I believe from that point on, you're what they call a golden arm. You're a golden arm, which is the, the, the qualified test pilot, and that's what they refer to them as, is the golden arms. Yikes. You were so lucky to get to the Navy recruiter. <laughs> I sure was. That worked out so well. Your first encounter with your new girlfriend, the shuttle. How? When? When did you? When did those wheels start turning? That this is what I need to do next. Well, when I first saw a 
drawing, an artist's concept of a space shuttle flying a re-entry, flying at this 40 degrees angle of attack with all the fire and flame around it coming back to land. I looked at that and I said, I have not been interested in being an astronaut before because they were flying capsules, but now I am. I had, fly, I had been flying F-14 Tomcats at the time. And here's an airplane that flies even higher and faster than my F-14 Tomcat. I want to fly those. And so I, I, I was already determined to go to test pilot school. If I wanted to fly space shuttles, I'd have to be a test pilot. And so uh, I went through test pilot school, and I had just finished test pilot school when they started interviews for the space shuttle. And so I remember... There had been one group of 20 pilots who had gone down to Johnson Space Center in Houston to interview with NASA for space shuttle astronaut. And I didn't get called in that first group of 20, but I got called in the second group of 20 the very next week. And you went down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston for an entire week. And much of it was physical testing was uh, a, a, a really detailed aviation physical uh, to make sure that everything was right with you. And there was uh, an interview with the selection board, which is kind of memorable because it was one against nine. It was the one of you sitting at the long table in the middle, and you had, you had five astronauts uh, there at the table with you. You had a, a, a HR person as well. Uh, and, and, and it was an hour and a half interview. And so I guess that could be kind of stressful because there was, uh, there was a lot at stake. So I'm sure I was a bit apprehensive about it. They went out of their way to make you feel comfortable. So it wasn't a grilling by any means. Uh, you also had two interviews with psychiatrists and one of them was the nice guy psychiatrist. The other one was the not so nice guy. And the nice guy was this friendly, you know, smiling, lean back in his chair and ask you questions about your family and your life and all that. The other guy, his job was to get you frustrated to see how you'd handle that. So I remember one of the things that he'd say is, okay, I'm going to give you a list of numbers. And then I want you to read that list of numbers back to me. So he'd see six, two, three, five, eight, one, four, eight. And, and if you did that, okay, then he'd say, okay, I'm going to give you a list of numbers now. Read it back to me backwards. And so he'd do the same thing. Well, I got, you know, I, th I think I did okay at it, but I also got amused by it. And so I realized, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to do this perfectly. So let's not worry about it. And so I guess I did okay because both of them, both of them passed me. Both of the psychiatrists passed me. So it was an interesting experience to do. But what happened? I finished, got to the end of the week. I went back to Patuxent River, and one of my fellow fighter pilot, test pilots there, asked me, well, how do you think you did? And I said, I don't think I stand any chance at all of being selected. I think I stand zero chance. So I was a little bit downhearted about the whole thing because I looked around at these other 19 pilots that I was interviewing with, and I'd been reading about a number of these guys. These were, these were well-known guys. I had just finished test pilot school. So that's why I thought, I don't stand any chance. Well, it was January the 16th, 1978, that the decisions had been made, and everybody got their phone calls telling them either yes or no. And that's the day that I found out that the answer was yes. I've been selected to be a space shuttle astronaut. I was the youngest pilot that they picked. So therefore, I was the most junior in experience. So they picked a range of ages, which therefore means you've picked a range of experience. The older guys are going to have more experience than I have. So they picked a whole range of people. And as the youngest pilot, that's, that's why I got picked. So it was the attraction of flying an airplane on the scale of the space shuttle rather than, you know, the mysteries of Star Wars and, and outer space that, that really motivated you to take that step. 
Yes, it was. And, and, and again, the situation was I was flying the F-14 Tomcat at the time. That was the world's newest and most capable jet fighter that there was. So I'm flying a Mach 2.4 jet. I'm flying an airplane that outturns the MiGs that were in existence then. And so it was, it was at the time, that was kind of the height of naval aviation. And along comes Space Shuttle, and I look at that and I say, you know, this is, this is even more capable and more incredible, and look at what the experience would be like going to space and spending, spending a week, spending 10 days in orbit, looking at this Earth, uh, going by at five miles per second. And so it was the, the lure of that that caused me to say, yes, that's what I want to do now. Challenger now visible at uh, Cape uh, at the Cape. Touch now. The Navy designed the F-14 for fleet tasks and we think it does uh, that job magnificently. The F-14 has been operating off of the USS Enterprise in the Pacific Fleet, and uh, that this is its fleet introduction, and that our experience has been that the aircraft's performance has exceeded expectations. Now, in a fleet air defense role, and, and that means uh, shooting down enemy aircraft, that threaten our ships at sea, we consider that the F-14 is about three times as good as the current F-4. The F-14, first and foremost, is an honest airframe. It's a product of the Grumman Iron Works. It flies and handles, controls simply, easily, nicely. It comes aboard at speeds approaching the a6 in the 120 knot area. The airplane has the computer controlled swing wing concept, which gives it a great advantage as far as being a good dogfighter is concerned. The F 14 has the long range Phoenix missile, which gives us approximately twice the range of any other missile that we know in existence today. As well as carrying the, the Phoenix, we do carry the Sparrow and the Sidewinder and the M61 Vulcan Cannon uh, for the closer in uh, dogfight arena. In summary, the F-14 is an extremely capable and flexible weapon system that does in fact permit the Navy to operate any place, any time. This is the fifth progress report on the F-14 program, and I am Rear Admiral Swoosh Sneed, the Navy's F-14 project manager. While this film covers events from January through September of this year, one of the big stories is taking place right here at the Naval Air Station at Miramar, California. The first two fleet F-14A fighter squadrons, VF-1 and VF-2, have begun independent squadron operations. At the same time, Readiness Squadron VF-124 is utilizing aircraft at about double its projected rate, getting twice as many flight hours per aircraft than expected for this time in the program. And all training flights are with full up weapon systems. A total of 13 aircraft have been delivered to the three squadrons here at Miramar, and delivery rates are accelerating. More and more air crews are being checked out in the Navy's newest weapon system.
Not all the training is being done in the air. Miramar is now the most advanced fighter training base in the world, and a good part of the credit for that title must go to one of the most advanced ground and maintenance training programs ever devised. In a specially constructed academic section, air crews are being trained with the most modern equipment. In addition to classrooms, there are self-study corrals where individuals can review audio-visual programs at their best learning tempo. Training is being enriched with color videotape cartridges covering a range of subjects from a general overview of the weapon systems to the specifics of in-flight refueling. Operational flight trainers Full-scale cockpits that never leave the ground provide dynamic realism for both members of the flight crew. Four of these operational flight trainers have been ordered by the Navy. In the first of these, delivered ahead of schedule, the pilot maneuvers through an electronically generated sky, practicing and repeating the skills required for a high-performance swing-wing fighter. Three more will be ready for training by July of next year. Uh, In the missile control operational trainer, the naval flight officer reads simulated radar inputs and exercises the capability of the F-14 weapon system tracking simulated targets and launching simulated missiles. Maintenance training is an inadequate phrase to describe the variety of that honed skills already sharpened by experience. Crew escape systems. They have to work only once, but they have to be ready all the time. These men are learning to ensure that capability on the cockpit escape system trainer. Thirteen different F-14 Naval Air Maintenance trainers are in place at Miramar. Engines and engines accessories hands-on training complements classroom theory. Taking it out of the airplane is one thing. Tuning it for maximum performance is another. The logic of the fuel system is observed in the maintenance trainer where the flow is visible and the valves and controls readily accessible for observation and adjustment. Flight controls, a matter of microsecond discipline on the part of electrical, hydraulic, and pneumatic components, can be a study unto itself. The flight control system simulator, an iron bird that never flies, gives technical insight to the interaction of all the elements. Specially trained instructors are on hand throughout, leading, teaching, and available to answer questions. The F-14 armament system comes in for its own share of attention. The total elements that go into the Phoenix missile are part of the curriculum for those who are charged with the AUG-9 system maintenance. Hands-on training plays a big part here as shown by one of six Phoenix missiles being hoisted onto an F-14 weapons rack. If, as the old saying goes, training makes the difference, then here indeed is training with a difference. No system is left untouched, and the sum of these systems, the airplane itself, is also providing training. Readiness Squadron VF-124 has 13 flying classrooms for air crew transitioning. While training is in full swing, there are Board of Inspection and Survey weapons trials scheduled for October completion. The Joint Evaluation Team, referred to as the JET, is comprised of the Naval Air Test Center at Patuxent River, Maryland, VX-4, and the Naval Missile Center at Point Magoo, California. This JET team is responsible for the on-time completion of these tests, using four aircraft from Patuxent River and three at Point Magoo. 
Between June and August of this year, the jet team conducted 11 missile firings, including two live AIM-7 Echoes, a dual Phoenix air launch, a double Sidewinder air launch, and a Phoenix air launch against a cruise missile. All firings were successful. The F-14's gun has been fired from Mach 8,000 feet, through 6Gs at 7,000 feet, and at 130 knots at 20,000 feet. A heads-up display camera recorded tracers being fired at a 30-foot long towed fiberglass target using direct windshield projection and a Grumman-developed real-time gun solution system. Tracers comprised one in every three rounds. Film speed was half normal time. Last December, five drone targets simulating MiG fighter aircraft were detected and tracked by an F-14A flying at Mach 0 0.7 at 31,500 feet. The AUG-9 system rapidly evaluated the five and selected the four with the greatest threat potential. Four Phoenix missiles were fired in rapid sequence. All four destroyed their targets. In June of 1973, in a severe look-down shoot-down test, a Phoenix missile with a live warhead was launched at a QT-33 target drone. The drone, flying 2,500 feet above the Naval Weapons Center range at China Lake, California, was destroyed. The F-14A was traveling at a speed of Mach 0.8 at 4,500 feet altitude. The range at time of missile launch was 11 nautical miles. With a total of 20 missile firings, 17 have been successful, one was a no test, for a success rate of 89.5%. The F-14A production continues on schedule in Bethpage, New York. The forward and mid-module of number 61 has been assembled and is ready for shipment to Calverton. An aircraft number 79 is in sub-assembly. At Calverton, Tomcat activity continues at a rapid pace with numbers 40 through 60 in various stages of final assembly. In addition, Aircraft numbers 36 through 39 are completed and in preparation for Navy cell. With aircraft now coming off the production line at a rate of four per month, the plan is to increase production to five per month by the end of the year. All major structural tests ended with completion of carrier suitability drop tests to as high as 26 feet per second at landing weights approaching 52,000 pounds. In late August, the fatigue article passed another milestone on the ground by achieving 6,000 equivalent flight hours or one times aircraft life on the wing, fuselage, and tail assemblies. At fighter configuration, this is equivalent to two times aircraft life or 12,000 equivalent flight hours. Aircraft number seven, the first F-14B equipped with two Pratt & Whitney F-401 advanced technology engines of 28,000 pounds thrust each was rolled out of its Calverton, New York hangar for engine run-up and taxi test. No external changes were required to fit the F-401s into the basic F-14A airframe. The advanced technology engine had undergone a total of 19 hours of ground tests at the Calverton facility prior to installation. This month, number seven began its flight test program with Grumman F-14 project pilot Joe Burke in the front seat. The first in this series of flight tests evaluated airframe power plant compatibility. The aircraft achieved a maximum speed of Mach 0.9 
and a maximum altitude of 35,000 feet. Just completing the expansion of the entire F-14 structural envelope is aircraft number three. To date, number three has cleared the six and one half G fighter envelope and has consistently flown to seven and one half Gs in the fighter configuration. At one point, number three attained 8.9 Gs within limit loads. Aircraft number two has gone from plus 90 to minus 50 degrees angle of attack at all external loads, wing sweeps, and center of gravity locations without a stall or departure. At a maximum angle of attack of minus 50 degrees, Air speeds as low as 60 knots were obtained at full forward stick applied at a moderate rate. Engine operation was excellent. While a French newspaper was calling the F-14 the pearl of the Paris air show, spectators at the highly acclaimed international event were calling the Tomcat's performance nothing short of spectacular. Commander Jim Taylor and Lieutenant Kurt Strauss put production airplane number 22 through its paces during the air show. After additional performances in England and Spain, the crew flew nine hours nonstop from Madrid to the Texas River, Maryland, using in-flight refueling before returning to Miramar, California. In July, another event with an international flavor occurred at Andrews Air Force Base near Washington, D.C. Grumman test pilot Don created some of the F-14's low altitude capabilities for His Royal Imperial Highness, the Shah of Iran. Included in this demonstration were a one-half Cuban aid on takeoff, a knife edge pass, Here he's pulling seven and a half G's at 400 knots. This low speed pass is at 95 knots. A touch and go at 100 knots, then climbing to 1,000 feet. This landing will be less than 2,000 feet of ground roll. The Shaw then had an opportunity to have a closer look at production aircraft number 22. This year has seen the attainment of the goals that were set for this time period. Of the 5,000 hours total flight time on the F-14s, 20%, or 1,000 hours, has been dedicated to formal Navy evaluation, with another 1,000 hours accumulated by Navy crews. There are 33 aircraft in flight status. The first two fighter squadrons are operating independently and in January will achieve total Navy support. The flight crews are transitioning into the new weapon system smoothly and on time. Maintenance training is preparing those who will support the aircraft in the fleet. The next step will be deployment.